a very good afternoon to everyone present here. Um, for the next 30 minutes, I would be talking about uh, the PhD work, um, the research work that I engaged in as part of my PhD. But before I move on to that, uh, a bit about myself. I finished my master's in September 2014. It was an Erasmus Mundus master's, so I divided my time between TU Dresden in Germany and then uh, IHE Delft, Netherlands. Soon after that, I moved to Switzerland, started my PhD as part of a Marie Curie project, QUICS, stands for Quantifying Uncertainty in Integrated Catchment Studies. What essentially the takeaway from here is that I am interested in rainfall runoff processes um, and study them in both um, urban and natural catchments. First, the problem statement. So um, a catchment can be seen as a system uh, which takes uh, some input and gives us some output. In the context of rainfall runoff, that input would be precipitation signal, and the output would be uh, flow at the uh, downstream of a catchment, which we call discharge. If we want to have mathematical models for the system to explain the phenomena in the system or to have uh, predictive uh, capabilities, we start with some simplifying assumptions. So essentially, we will have some measurements of the input signal, some equations uh, which, which correspond to the dominant processes in the catchment, and then observations of the system response. Already during this modeling exercise, we, we make the simplifications which entail errors. Uh, for example, the inadequate sp spatial resolution of the precipitation measurements, neglecting several sub-processes, and the output itself would be uh, uncertain. The measurements would, uh, would not have cross-sectional variability at many times. So by this very nature, we expect that there would be a mismatch between what our model says and how the reality will turn out to be. What we would like to have is a quantitative understanding of that uncertainty. Um, so if we have a, a model, which let's say I call the best guess about how the water level would turn out to be, we would like to have prediction intervals. Uh, how much can we trust those models? And this is the overarching theme of my PhD, trying to uh, investigate statistical techniques which work in hydrology to give reliable prediction intervals and tailoring those techniques for particular, uh, our particular needs. Why do we do this? Uh, some apology for why I uh, do what I do is um, one can do risk-based decision making based on these evaluation of probabilities. Uh, so uh, the, if you are trying to do design uh, based on these models, uh, uh, the safety factors that we use are hard to justify in terms of their economy and efficiency. So instead, you can talk in the language of failure probabilities depending how much risk averse you are, you can choose P or 2P as a probability of design. Uh, predictable aggregate effects for hydrologic phenomena which have frequent tendencies like floods over the years in a city. You can have some uh, a predictable uh, expected damage, how the, the damage would turn out to be in a city over several years. And uh, uh, in terms of its pure scientific applicability, if you have two models or hypotheses explaining the same data to a varying degree, you don't falsely accept or reject. You assign probabilities to these hypotheses till more differentiating data comes in. Um, overview of my work, uh, the first part of the PhD was investigating a simple uh, uncertainty estimation technique. The details would come later. So this is just quantification of uncertainty. The second step was actually going forward and reducing uncertainty by learning from complementary information uh, about the system and the model. The third part was an investigation into seeking more flexibility in the statistical descriptions that define hydrologic time series in order to make them more representative. So the goal was making those statistical representations more representative of the kind of time series we see in hydrology. So this would be trying to generate, uh, have a stochastic process, which is more or less the observation generating process. This was the first paper uh, that I worked on. Uh, motivation. Um, so in operational hydrology, uh, we are actually, you have large catchments and uh, operators have models defined for those catchments already. Monte Carlo simulations uh, 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 generally uh, have high computational costs, which everyone is not willing to engage in. But what we have specifically in the case of hydrology in many catchments, not all, would be long time series of observations of how the river or the 
drainage network or the system response happens uh, at the very end. This is case in several cases where we have long time series of observations, not enough motivation to do Monte Carlo simulation, and then the, the question was, are there techniques available which will give some face, faithful quantification of uncertainties over and above the deterministic best guess? Uh, we used uh, a technique called KNN resampling. It has existed, especially in the context of hydrology, for decades now. We've used a certain simplification of it and try to investigate how valuable it is. We try to simplify it as much as possible for the quantification of uncertainty. So what you see here is uh, V bold would be a vector of uh, relevant hydrological variables on which we assume our uncertainties are statistically dependent, the error is statistically dependent, and then we define that n-dimensional space, and we populate that space with the past observations. So this, this one component of this vector could be, let's say, rainfall, or what my model predicts, or what the system uh, response discharge or flow I observed, and then we populate what we had measured from the past. And given the new prediction step where my model predicts something new, what we essentially do is we just go to the past, collect the errors from the past, and assume, that's the big assumption here, that model will more or less make similar errors as it made in the past, and that would be our uh, prediction uncertainty or re residual uncertainty. So essentially, we assume that these nearest neighbors are samples from the distribution, uh, the error distribution at the current prediction time step. And uh, this would be the current prediction time step. This is the past data which we populate the errors from. We applied this technique on several case studies and tried to see is it valuable or not. Like uh, this may not be of interest to you. There are three sub catchments in UK, uh, 100 to around 200 square kilometers big. And then there's a discharge that gets modeled by the environmental agency. They already have models uh, which have fixed parameters. They have calibrated using uh, cost functions and they have long time series of observations. So what we did was then, um, quite a few graphs will follow uh, uh, this pattern. There would be time and then hydrologic system response. Points would always be the observations and the models generally would be represented through lines. The shaded area would be the uncertainty bands that are given through various techniques I have worked on. So then what we had was we had models predicting the water level in one of these sub catchments which would be the red line. And using this KN and resampling, we, we produced uh, these bands. And you, as you can see, observations more or less lie within the bands. And this is model predicting 24 hours into the future. If the same model is used to predict 48 hours into the future, then the performance of the model deteriorates and the uncertainty ba bands be become bigger for the same kind of observation. So this, 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 um, Changing variance gets reproduced by this technique. Naturally, it goes back and sees how the model performed in the past in those situations. Uh, this is called heteroscedasticity. I, it took me a while to master this tongue twister, essentially, which means changing variance, and that, that gets captured. Another metric through which we measure the, the reliability of these forecasts, forecasting intervals, are these uh, reliability diagrams. So if you have a, a, a forecast interval and then your observed frequency of the observations lie within that band, you would, you would see a straight line. This would be the case of overconfident forecasts, underconfident forecasts. And for various lead times, three catchments, we see more or less K and N resampling produces uh, uh, reliable intervals and the reliability decreases as we predict far into the future. We compare this simple technique to other established uh, 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 techniques which use uh, uh, resampling of errors in uh, another way, but they build more complicated regression models around the quantiles of the errors. Uh, what you would see here to, to make sense of this is we would like, if we have a 90% prediction interval, we would like 90% observations to more or less lie in that interval. And this is one technique, another technique called quantile regression. This is the k nearest neighbor. And you have to see these histograms, which correspond to KNN, are a bit higher or at least comparable. So observations lie within those bands. And this would be the width of the interval. So KNN resampling also gives narrower intervals. 
We did further validations with some of my colleagues from the Geological Survey of Denmark. They had a different system, uh, system response in this uh, case, evapotranspirations. You have a model, your observations, and k and resampling more or less produces faithful intervals where you see observations lying. So conclusions, the method produces reliable intervals, uh, given the definition of reliability in the previous slide. It has a tendency also to capture some of the more systematic errors. So this resampling technique somehow is a model plus an uncertain analysis technique. If in the past your model consistently overestimates or uh, overestimated or underestimated, that gets reproduced in your error samples and then your bands move up above or below your model prediction. The performance is comparable to other more sophisticated residual uncertainty estimators. The, the key word is comparable to these techniques. Uh, the, uh, beyond quantification of uncertainty, the next step was how to reduce, have more, uh, 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 more trust in the models that we predict, how to reduce that uncertainty. What we know that there is now a, 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 a plethora of sensors used uh, uh, which, give, which give observations which may not be called conventional. It, CCTV cameras um, having uh, uh, measuring inundation and then cheap sensors trying, uh, giving you uh, information whether a, a river overtopped a bank or not. How can we use that observation, not from the conventional sensors like flow dars or uh, gauges, in model calibration and not discard that data. That was the question we tried to answer. And then what is the information gain in such sensor data? This would be the flow chart um, where um, essentially you have a hydrologic catchment. If, uh, this is the top view. And then you will have the system response measured here. We assume this system response is censored. There is some kind of limited information in these observations. Uh, then we use Bayesian updating to up, update our belief about the model parameters given these observations. And given those updated uh, parameter values, we expect that the model would perform better and the uncertainties uh, would have reduced the parametric uncertainties, at least. Defining sensor observations, the, these few slides will help do that. This would be let's say, model predicting the system response, then the system response would turn out to be different than what your model predicted. And if you have measurements at different time slices of this exact uh, physical realization, that would be uncensored observations. If your sensor is not able to uh, uh, capture the exact value of the system response above or below a threshold, all it tells you that the system went above a threshold, like the banks of the river overtopped, or in a, um, in a drainage system, something went um, uh, over, the water overtopped the network. That information then would be sensor. So AT would be above threshold, BT would be below threshold. And this is what we call sensor observations. Binary observations can be seen as extreme sensing. You have to imagine these two threshold collapsing on each other. And then all your sensor measures is that the system is going above threshold, below threshold, above threshold, below threshold, without having the exact values of the system response. Um, there is already one of the state of the art description of errors over and above your model that's used in hydrology. So essentially, you assume bigger errors are less likely to happen. This is the probability density over and above your model. Smaller errors are more likely to happen. And then errors have a memory. So this is a, a multivariate normal distribution with a covariance structure is used to model the mismatches. This is one of the state of the arts. And given that description, we just wanted to update it that this description now can take into account this kind of observation. So suddenly, uh, we, we will not have exactly these measurements where there is a model and then these dashed lines. But we will have measurements which say something can the system could be anywhere between uh, the upper threshold and infinity. We don't know where it is. Um, without going into the details, you can uh, look at the methodolog methodological details in my paper. We had to define this probability density, which then helps us uh, update our beliefs uh, in parameters from prior understanding of where the parameter value should lie to uh, this conditional distribution that Given the observations, where do the parameter values lie? 
we borrowed existing tools from statistics where they are able to evaluate these probabilities of a multivariate normal distribution given such kind of data and this checked it for um, hydrologic studies. So uh, we had a um, short measurement cam campaign in an urban catchment in Lucerne. What you see here is a schematic of the catchment at the, uh, uh, at the very um, uh, the downstream of the catchment, we installed these uh, uh, sensors. And if you see the cross section of the structure, you will have water level. And when the water level in this network increases and goes over, our uh, weir, uh, over the weir crest, which we know is the threshold, then we get observations. So I will have to explain, there are gonna be a lot of uh, many lines uh, um, in, the, in the upcoming graphs. I will go one by one. Again, these are observations which our inference procedure is blind to. These are the, the uncensored observations. This was our prior understand, prior best understanding of the model parameters, which overestimated um, the flow quite a bit. As, and this is the threshold corresponding to uh, the weir crest. And as soon as observations go above it, uh, the, the water goes above the weir crest, we, we get a binary signal. So this is the maximum prior, the model corresponding to maximum prior probability density of our parameters. So once we throw the binary data at the inference problem and learn about the model parameters, the posterior best guess is relatively better uh, than the prior best guess and it falls closer to the uncensored observations. But all we threw at it was in the calibration phase, this is the validation phase, some binary observations. The ba over and above our deterministic best case, we also get some understanding of the uncertainty bands. So this would be uh, the 90% prediction intervals that we have. What happens in the parameter space is that we had some wide understanding of the, the we, had, uh, we had some understanding of where our model parameters lie before we threw data at the inference problem. And once we infer the parameters, the priors, which are these dashed lines, get updated to posteriors. If we just throw binary observations, they get updated to these light green posteriors. If we throw the, uh, the uncensored observations, then they get very narrow. What you see here is this was the most sensitive parameter and more or less binary and uncensored observations took the parameters to the same place. The other, uh, the other parameters vary because they, ha they were less sensitive to produce similar response. So binary was not able to capture the parameters uh, well enough. Conclusions, takeaways, sensory, sensor observations used and not discarded. Generally, they used to be discarded. Now you can use it in your uh, inference exercise. Inference technique am amenable to sequential updating. So as longer time series of binary observations come in, you can keep updating uh, your parameter, belief in your parameter. So that can happen sequentially and consistently. Application of this technique improves model predictions. This is, again, uh, like many statements, uh, uh, an inductive statement for, at least for a case study, it worked in certain cases. So it, it, it improves the model prediction. And we hope using this technique, what we can do is supplement cheap and robust binary sensors to the already existing measuring instruments. So you can have both uncensored plus censored observations and then, then your model, uh, uh, your calibration exercise would be better. Uh, coming to the third part of my uh, PhD, this was then um, further exploration into the nature of time series that we have in rainfall runoff and in some ways nature of error time series that we have in hydrologic models. Um, the motivation here would be uh, some of the, the, what's the need why do we need to put the statistical understanding into our errors? What's the benefit for an applied scientist, let's say, who, is just, who just cares about a model which has some predictive performance? Uh, a linear model is, this is generally used in hydrology as, a, uh, as, an, uh, as an example where the value of techniques, likelihood functions is shown. Let's say we have a linear model which takes in a sinusoidal precipitation and has two parameters, has some error structure and gives us the discharge. The error structure actually has the property of autocorrelation. It has memory in time. So if your model underestimates, it's more likely to underestimate at the next time step. Overestimate, it's more likely to overestimate. And it has the property of heteroscedasticity. If you predict 
large flows, more or less the errors are going to be large, so uncertainties are bigger. And in the more uh, known regime of flows, your model performs well. So this, these are the properties we gave to these time series. And what if we then don't assume those properties? We assume that the error is uh, uh, identical and uh, independent. What happens is if the error is not identical and independent, but you assume those properties, you will get bands which are uh, uh, narrow here, wide here. And if you assume the true error, you, the properties of the error are reproduced in the probability description of errors, then you see the difference here. Your bands would be more representative. They would be narrower here, wider here. And what happens in the parameter space is these are the true parameter values that we use to produce this data. Um, here you will see the parameter inference is biased. And if you use a true, true probability model which generates the synthetic data, then the inference will not be biased as opposed to you. This doesn't have a lot of influence B as the intercept on a linear model. But if you are inferring a parameter complex model, inference gives you biased values and then you project an extra point using those models, um, you, your model will have big errors. So you do not want the inference to be biased. I've already used these additive error models, which are one of the techniques to a certain degree of success for some case studies. We used it for rainfall runoff model parameter updating, sediment wash off model parameter updating. In this case, at least it worked really well. Um, but there are scenarios, this is again one of the theory, where it wouldn't work because that's not how er errors are being produced in the system. Let's say we have a, a low flows here, base flows, and high flows, and I assume uh, an autoregressive additive error which has a Gaussian autocorrelated noise. This is what will happen, is that to compensate the model, bring this model close to the data here, it, it will underestimate the peak here. So the statistical properties of the error should also be represented. Otherwise, you will, for all practical purposes, you get biased models. What we then try to do, can we have a, 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 a stochastic descriptions which are more flexible and you can tweak them given you have some understanding of the data? We use a tool from statistics called copulas. It's a, 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 the equation here which represents what we are trying to do. For those who haven't heard of copulas, it's a special kind of cumulative probability uh, distribution defined over a unit cube. It has certain properties. All the marginals are, uh, are uniform. There's a theorem which tells that all multivariate distributions can be the marginals of their components and the dependence between various uh, uh, components can be captured by the copula. So all you need is the marginals of each component of a multivariate distribution and a copula, and then you can you can define the that multivariate normal distribution. In hydrology, copulas have been used again to capture time series uh, correlation, and then we uh, we we use the same technique, brought it to the uh, uh, made it such that. This can be now used as a model and not just uh, uh, the marginals P, T, uh, P, Y, T, minus 1, P, Y, T are not just uh, uh, constructed from uh, data, but you can uh, assume some uh, uh, parametric distributions here. You can be free to choose the parametric distribution, and then autocorrelation can be uh, captured by a copula. Uh, again, in simple terms, what I'm trying to say is essentially uh, going back here. We can assume that there's some marginal distribution of errors here, here at each time step, and we still are able to capture the time autocorrelation through appropriate copulas. And that gives us flexibility. We can use probability densities which have a non-zero support, so then you don't have negative flows being predicted which do not make sense, and then those flexibility can be used. This is one of the renditions of 500 random draws from such a stochastic model. You see narrower bands here, wide bands here. Uh, this is, again, synthetic data. But what happens on the real case study? We then try to model the flow at the end of a catchment, again, in UK, using a very simple model, which we know will have deficits, uh, unit hydrograph convolution. And I then try to infer using uh, the copula-based likelihood description and uh, the autoregressive Gaussian 
uh, description. First, coming back to synthetic exercise, this is what Copula does here. We, we already gave it marginals here, which we allow the model to make big errors here. And then we don't underestimate for the more interesting flows out there. For the real case study, something similar happens. More faithful bands up here, uh, narrower bands here. With caveats, which I will say, is with very big caveats, actually. So we demonstrate the flexibility of this uh, stochastic process. It has been used already in some variations. Of, uh, we used it plus uh, this description of a time series plus a deterministic error, a deterministic model which, um, which, which informs us about uh, this distribution. So the deterministic model informs us about the nature of this distribution. Um, and then we get these stochastic time series. It can potentially capture complex errors, leading to better predictions. The change to make the inference, ro the, uh, the, the challenge to make the inference robust still remains open. And that's, that, that's one of the biggest challenge. What I mean by that is that if you use this, this flexible description and have marginal densities of errors and copula chosen which represent your process, then you get representative bands. But again, if this flexibility exists, you use wrong uh, marginals and the wrong copulas, which are not representative, it's totally not robust. The, the technique, uh, uh, the technique uh, takes you to copula parameters, which, which, which may not be very physical. So you have to be careful that the description, you have to use this flexibility um, with care. So sum summarizing the goal of this work was to uh, investigate techniques which are already out there, borrow them from statistics, see whether uh, they, they have any value for rainfall runoff time series for hydrologic modeling. Uh, away from the community specific language, what it means is uh, apart from the deterministic best guess, giving reliable prediction intervals to our models, uh, assigning correct probabilities, and then reducing those probabilities. Uh, to achieve this uh, earlier, we, uh, towards the first half of my PhD, I, I was investigating one of the simple techniques, which functions well to give you estimates, then went on to reduce that uncertainty using parameter estimation. Towards the, uh, the end of my PhD, I was trying to investigate where the errors come from. So it's very interesting while at one time we were all thinking as the community how the deterministic error models can, made be, uh, can be made better to represent the process. Now the same questions are being asked about the stochastic models, how they can be made better uh, and they can represent the process better. However, needless to say, challenges remain, quite a few of them. I would uh, try to uh, delineate two of the uh, two of the challenges I think are interesting. Uh, robustness of likelihood functions that in this probabilistic paradigm, if we are trying to give probabilities to parameters, to the output space, uh, no matter how, uh, 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 in spite of the rigor of these techniques, uh, they should uh, be robust that minimally they take the model parameters such that the model goes towards the data and doesn't diverge away from data. You can have descriptions in which you infer parameters which do not represent the local hydrology. So that can be the case, making them robust. And inference techniques for other non-conventional observations, there is, uh, there's already research going on on uh, description likelihood functions in uh, AIRWAG and also there's uh, quite a bit of work around measuring non-conventional observations like CCTV cameras, measuring flood inundation depths. Uh, we sometimes know the rate of change of uh, the floods, but we don't know the absolute value. Having likelihood functions or inference techniques which can capture that observation and give us more representative models would be another uh, nice thing to do. And um, with that, I uh, mentioned some of the papers that I uh, present the results from especially these three papers. Um, if you want to go into the details of the papers, you can refer to them. Um, before I finish, I would like to acknowledge uh, my supervisors, especially uh, uh, Jörg Andreas Marx, uh, enormous support throughout my PhD. All collaborating authors, this is uh, not one person's work. Uh, uh, together, uh, we were able to do some very cool things. 
and all colleagues, friends, and family. With that, I end my presentation. Thank you very much.